Meatloaf, the poet of the 80s, sang of love unrequited. Do you know the song? Could be any of his songs, really. Yep. <laughs> Two out of three ain't bad. There's a line, I'm tired of crying and I'm too forced to shout. But you've been cold to me so long, I'm crying icicles instead of tears. Have you not heard it? Yeah, no. One person's heard it. <laughs> sad and neglected. No, more than one? Yeah. Who, who has heard it? Okay, the rest of you go and look at it on YouTube. Honestly. After church. Ah, no. <laughs> Put the iPad. Um, the basic story of the song is Meatloaf loved a woman once who didn't love him. And so he's unable to love another. And so she said to him, and he says to another, uh, that I, I can't love you. He says, uh, it's two out of three, ain't bad. He says, uh, I want you, I need you, but I'm never going to love you. And she says that to him, and he passes that on to his next girlfriend. And you get the impression that his love is exhausted. Or his ability to love is gone. He's, he's poured it all out on this one woman. And so he can't give any more to anyone. Tonight I want to talk about the exhausted wrath of God. In Ezekiel 4 to 7, we read of God's terrible and amazing wrath against people. We read why he is angry with them and what the result is. And it's not pretty. We live in a culture with people who like to think that God is nice and tame and ready to help just whenever I ask him. In actual fact, that tells us nothing about God, but more about what people like to think about God. The God who we meet in the Bible is jealous, and powerful, and terrifying when His wrath is provoked by His people. We will read of the judgment which God will bring upon His people, and then we'll look at the applications for us today. But before we do that, let's pray. Oh Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Please open our hearts and minds as we consider your word tonight. And we ask that you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. It'd be tough being a prophet, wouldn't it? You, you thought they'd just get up, preach, people listen, repent. It's good. Well, that's what Jonah does. Ezekiel gets to act out the judgment of God against Jerusalem. Now, what does that look like? Let me show you. Jerusalem, you're in trouble. You keep telling God that you're listening to him, but you never do, and you never do what he wants. Okay, do that for 390 days. <laughs> Judah, you keep sinning. Honestly, what makes you think you will survive the wrath that is to come? Seriously? sink in every day for a year or two months. What about the food? Did you read those weird measurements? The shekels and the... That's how much bread he's talking about. And that's how much water. I don't know about you, but that's lunch to me. And this is your daily allotment of really actually rubbishy bread and poor water. He demonstrates their wickedness for over a year. Now the question is why, why does Ezekiel need to do this? See, where was Ezekiel when this was happening? Can anyone remember from last week? Where was Ezekiel when he got this word from God? Seven days ago. Chapter 1. He was among the exiles in the Kibar River. And, and so, he is speaking to those who have already been pulled out of the nation. In the first attack of Nebuchadnezzar against Jerusalem, he carries off 
some of the people. This is where Daniel comes into it. And we think Ezekiel was in that group. And so while he's out among the exiles, there might be the hope that Jerusalem will still hold the hope for the return of the kingdom, for the return of God's nation. Not a chance. Ezekiel lies down for a year and two months, day in and day out, to demonstrate the wickedness of the people of God. He bears the sin of Israel for 390 days, each day representing a year. 390 years of God's people saying, Stuff you. I am going to do what I want. He represents the wickedness of Judah for 40 days, each day being a year. 40 years of God's people saying, We have the temple of the Lord. We will be okay. We can do whatever we want. And God is required to protect us. Not on your life. For some people, the question of why is this exile happening to us was still there. And Ezekiel's job was to show them why. And he does it graphically. Now, as we read through chapter 5, we see more that God has deliberately set up to scatter his people. I mean, if you had a good haircut and you were the prophet, that was bad news. Get a sword, cut your hair, scatter it. A third, killed by fire. That's the famine, the plague. A third, killed by sword. A third, scattered to the wind. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean exactly one third, one person in three. But he's saying, he's like, some will, do, will die this way, some will die this way. And only a tiny, if you see that in verse 3, a tiny fragment is tucked inside his cloak, a remnant for later. Why was God angry with the people? What provoked him to such anger? Uh, look at chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Yet in her wickedness she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than the nations and countries around her. She has rejected my laws and has not followed my decrees. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. You have been more unruly than the nations around you and have not followed my decrees or kept my laws. You have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. The people of God rebelled against him more than the nations around them. The people who did not know God or have any idea of what he wanted with their lives did a better job of pleasing God than his own people, the ones he had spoken to, the ones he had blessed with his temple, with his word, with his prophets and his covenants. There is in this whole book of Ezekiel a sense of God saying, I don't expect the nations to know me. I don't expect them to know what I want. But you know better. You should know what I want. How is it that you do worse at this than the Gentiles, or at least can say, oh, we didn't know. <coughs> Have a look at verse 13 of chapter 5. Then my anger will cease, and my wrath against them will subside. I have spent my wrath on them. God's anger will have an end for the people of Judah. We see that also today. Of course, when God's wrath is spent against his people in Ezekiel, it's because they are virtually wiped out. He is speaking of just the remnant remaining, whereas all the rest have been scattered, all the rest have been killed, all the rest have fallen to famine and the sword. 